from another mother, same father, God. I said that before, my father's like, I ain't know that. <laughs> so I wanted to clarify, God the father. <laughs> but uh, certainly, um, we've been through ministry together. Uh, he is why I'm married to my wife, but he's also the reason why my wife almost left me before I even got a chance to marry her. And it was only because I would spend hours with him and another brother praying. I mean, hours, just prayer. And my wife was like, don't nobody pray that long. Where else were you at? It's like we were praying for hours, I promise you. And we really were. We were praying for hours. And it was uh, this brother and another brother by the name of Mark, uh, Marcus Harvey, um, that a sister by the name of Pastor Cynthia, she prophesied over our lives. And it was three of us together. And she spoke to me and she said, you have an apostolic calling on your life. And I was like, hmm, is there something I can take for that? Because I didn't know what apostolic meant. It sounded like I had a disease. And so she said that about me and I looked up apostolic. It was like Paul, the apostle Paul, a church planner, a pastor. I was like, oh no, that's wrong. Marcus and I both said, you mean Lamar. That's the one you're talking about because he is going to be a pastor. And not only was he going to be a pastor, but he is a pastor of amazing church in LaGrange um, and, and doing amazing things down there. He's the author of two amazing books, one of which is available for your purchase today. Uh, he'll sign them for you. They're in the back uh, in our Mosaic Cafe. They're $13 each. Um, amazing book. I think it's what, like number one, number two? You're at the top of the chart somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been called to speak about this book. Uh, he's got this book, uh, I Am Strong, and also Epic Church. So let's definitely support him. I can go on and on. He's got his beautiful bride. I mean, look at, look at you. Just, wow. I would feel like I want to sing She's Your Queen to Be, but <laughs> it, it wouldn't be good. You deserve way more than that. Uh, but uh, his bride, uh, Isabella, is here and their beautiful children. I think I saw Malachi back there. What's up, Mally, in the building? Come on one time for your mind. And uh, also uh, his other children here. Phenomenal, phenomenal man. I can go on. I could just preach about you. That's how much I love you. But listen, uh, coming up next is my good friend, the right reverend, the right reverend, Dr. Lamar Hardwick. Would y'all put your hands together for my man? But. Well, good morning. morning. It is definitely a blessing to be here with uh, Pastor B and Erica. Can you guys just give it up again for your pastor and his lovely wife? We, we're going to do that again at some point in the sermon. Just because I don't know if you, if you know that October is... Um, clergy appreciation, pastor appreciation month. And so I'm going to encourage you because pastoring is hard. Yes, sir. I know sometimes people think we only work one day a week, uh, but pastoring is hard. So I'm going to encourage you a little bit later on to just uh, be a blessing to them. Thank you, Pastor B and Erica for the invitation. We bring you greetings from New Community Church in LaGrange, Georgia. We've been here before. Some of you, uh, I remember. Some of you, uh, there's some new faces, so that's good. God is doing some some growth. Uh, but we are excited to share with you. We, we kind of consider Mosaic a sister church because Broderick and I have been friends uh, for a long time. I won't tell you how long because then it'll let you know how old he is. Because <laughs> he is way older than I am. <laughs> But we're excited about five years. Uh, as he mentioned, I, I uh, brought one of uh, my books. Uh, it did at, at, in January, release at number three uh, on Amazon. And so um, <laughs> I want to make sure that you pick that up. And it's really a story of my life. Um, and 2014, being diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which is an autism spectrum disorder. Uh, at the time, I was 36 years old. Um, just a lifetime of struggling, not understanding why I didn't understand certain things, and I uh, finally got some answers. But I share that because it was next to uh, giving my life to Christ was one of the most spiritual experiences uh, of my life. And so even if you don't know someone who's been diagnosed, it's just great um, just for you to 
figure out how to overcome things. As Paul says, when I am weak, I am strong. Uh, and so make sure you pick that up because the proceeds of this book go to feed hungry children. Mine. So. <laughs> Well, let's jump into uh, the word. I don't know how uh, y'all are used to it, but at NCC, we like to get down. I do something uh, oftentimes that I call treaching. I teach a little bit and I preach a little bit. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago, I coined something called a seminar. So I did a little bit of a sermon, a little bit of a seminar. And then, you know, it's five years old. That's a big deal. Five is the number of grace. So I couldn't decide if I wanted to treach, if I wanted to do a seminar. But then I said, you know, there's a, a prayer that I have for Pastor B and for this church. And then uh, for those of you who understand what it means to speak a prophetic word, I couldn't, I didn't, I couldn't figure it out. So I said, I want to do a, a prophetic message. <laughs> So I might do a little bit of treaching, a little bit of a seminar, and I might do a prayer fetic, my prayer for you and what I believe that God is saying for you. Wow, five years old. Uh, I kind of looked this up because I want you to understand how big this is. Uh, church planting statistics, a couple that I found, uh, four out of five church plants don't survive at all. Don't survive at all. 68% of churches survive after four years. So only 68% of churches survive after they reach the four-year mark. And so I started to think, you know, think about five years, um, because the church is an organism. It's not just an organization. It is an organism. What are some milestones of a five-year? I see most of us uh, have children here, those of you I know who have children. So if you had children uh, and they passed through, even if they haven't got to five, there are certain things that they look for when you get five years old. And I thought it would be cool to see what were some of those characteristics. And I'm not going to give them all to you, but this is what the CDC says are five-year milestones in children. One, they become more self-aware. So they kind of know what's going on. They learn a little bit more about themselves. Sometimes you just need a little bit under your belt, Pastor, for you to, to be able to understand a little bit more about your church and a little bit more about you. Sometimes it takes about five years for you to get your footing. The second thing is that they become more discerning. Or in other words, they can tell reality from make-believe. They can understand what's real and what's not real. Number three, they speak clearly. I know that my wife and I have three kids, uh, 12, soon to be nine, and a four-year-old who thinks he's 40. And he's beginning to speak a little bit more clearly, sometimes too clear, and we have to tell him, I'm not gonna tell you what we tell him, but number four. And this is the most important thing that I wanna uh, preach and speak over you, that at the age of five, uh, five-year-olds begin to understand future tense. That before the age of five, they can only think about right now. And for some of them, they can talk about what was. But at the age of five, they begin to understand something called vision. Something about what is to come. Something about the future. At the age of five is when you get more clarity about what it is that is to come. And so I want to jump down into, this is the part where I'm going to do a little bit of treaching. I want to jump down into Psalm 84. I'm going to use this as a backdrop and I want to make sure that you get where we're going today. Psalms 84 and 10 because today is a day to celebrate. The thing about birthdays and anniversaries is that we're celebrating that day but we're not just celebrating celebrating that day. We're celebrating a day that started. We're celebrating the day that something started. The thing about anniversaries and birthdays is I celebrate a birthday, but it's really a celebration of the first day, the first day that this thing gets started. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says in Psalm 84 and 10, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. In other words, here's what the psalmist is saying, that one day alone is worth it. He says a day in your courts, a single day in your courts to celebrate five years, but the first day and the first service and the first message and the first time Mosaic opened its doors, that day alone was worth it. He says, I will rather spend one day in God's house than a thousand in the houses of those who are rich. Than a thousand. Can I just tell you this? Can you please make sure that you're praying for your pastor because he says right here that watch this it takes guts to be a gatekeeper 
Y'all missed that because he says that there's some things that I had to give up in order for me to be a gatekeeper. There's some things that I traded in. Most of us don't know this, but anybody who's been called to be a pastor has at one point had to make a decision about what they're going to give up. He says, I would rather spend one day preaching the gospel. I would rather spend one day, even if this church doesn't make it past one day, one day was worth it because I traded in everything I had for God. He says that it takes, it takes guts. See, one day it was worth it, but can I just tell you, here's what the celebration is about. 1,825 days is more worth it. He says that one day is worth it, but, but you all have 1,825 days, so not only was it worth it, but can I just tell you, it's also work. One day is worth it. He says it takes guts to be a gatekeeper. It takes guts just to even start. It takes guts just to answer the call. It takes guts just to say that God has called us to set up shop in Mableton and impact this community. It takes guts. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God because it takes guts to give up all the other stuff that I could be enjoying. Pastor B has guts. It takes guts just to say, I'm going to do this, even though there's some stuff that I have to give up. But can I tell you that, and we've heard this on the video, that the number five, if you know anything about biblical numerology, it's the number of grace. And so while it's worth it one day, can you imagine how much grace it has taken to make it 1,825 days? That's work. That's work. Somebody just say work, 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 work. Some of y'all looking like you, you ain't been saved that long. You looking like you don't know that song. See, it takes grace to be able to help you watch this. Manage. See, it takes guts to start, but it takes grace to be able to manage. 1,825 days. It took guts to start, but it's taken grace to sustain you. Anybody here know about grace? You know, it's the stuff that kind of makes up the gap between your abilities and what you lack. You know what about grace? Paul talks a lot about grace. That's the source of the subject matter for my book. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. This is what he says about grace. He says, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times. I begged the Lord to take it away and each time he said my grace is all you need so that's good I'm going to start right there because sometimes we think we need more than what we really need God, I, I need more. I need more money. God, I need more people. God, I need more members. But you don't make it to 1,825 days. There's only one thing that you need. And God says, it's my grace. It's my grace. And while you're praying about all this other stuff that you need, Paul, who says that I have this issue that I can't get rid of. And it's been a lot of work and I've had the guts to start. But there's some stuff that sometimes doesn't feel like it's working out. God, there's this issue that he begged God for three different seasons of his life and God's response was all you need is grace and he says that my power works best in weakness Here's why I love this. This is why I tell people about my stories. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses. Watch this. So that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here's something you got to understand about Paul because all of us look at Paul. Paul's one of my heroes. We think Paul, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul is the man. But can I just let you in on a secret? Paul wasn't that great of a preacher. Matter of fact, there's a story that said that he preached so long and he was so boring that a young man fell asleep and fell out the window and broke his neck and Paul had to raise him from the dead. Paul was not a great preacher. Paul said himself that there are other people that are more eloquent than I am. He talks about they are super apostles. Some, there's some part of Corinthians where they said that Paul, when we meet you, your, your pen is more prolific than your personality. You write better than you speak. When we run up on you, you look weak. All this stuff you've been dropping on us, all this heavy theology, and when we run into you, 
you, Paul, you look like nobody. And Paul realized that I'm really nobody. It's only because of his grace. Paul said, I know you think I'm a hero. And this is for the first time that we really get an insight into Paul's personal life. He's been teaching. He's been preaching. But for the first time, Paul lets us know that I've got some issues. I've got some struggles. As a matter of fact, Paul would say, I have more, watch me, personal struggles than public successes. I know you think I'm all that. I know you think that I've got it all together. I know you see me traveling around playing churches. But Paul says, let me open up my life to you. It's only because of his grace. Y'all not feeling me up in here. Let me go to this side because y'all acting funny. He says that I know it looks like on the outside I got it all together, but the only reason that we've made it 1,825 days is because of his grace. It's the only reason that we've made it this far. And Paul realizes that, you know what, this, this whole thing about grace is what helps you to feel like I have more public successes than I really do. He said, I've got more personal struggles than I do per private success, personal struggles than I do public successes. See, it takes grace, watch this, to give you the grit beyond your gift. Okay, some of y'all missed that. Because there's some stuff, can, can I just be real, permission to speak freely, Pastor? There's some stuff that you're not that gifted with. Okay, y'all acting real sedidified. I thought I had a real church in here. There is some stuff that you think you're good at, but you're really not that good. Paul couldn't preach. Paul could, he could barely write. Paul had eyesight problems. Paul had all kinds of issues, and he understood that I'm not all that. It's only because of his grace. Grace will give you the grit, watch this, to persevere past your gift. There is some stuff that I learned as a pastor that I suck at. I'm not good at it. I'm never going to be good at it, but the reason why you think think I'm better than I am is not because of me. It's because of his grace. There's some stuff that you ain't going to know how to do. You ain't going to know when to do it. You ain't going to know why to do it. You ain't going to know how to do it. But when his grace steps in, it pushes you past your personal gift and gives you the grit to make it 1,825 days despite the fact that I have no idea what I'm doing. It's his grace. Come on now. Because there's some stuff, to be honest with you, you're not as fly as you think you are. I'm kind of, I'm kind of mad at, no shade on Beyonce, I'm kind of mad at Beyonce because Beyonce has kind of taught us what I call, she's given us this Beyonce belief system. Okay, you're not feeling me. She just said, I woke up like this. Can I just somebody say, you didn't just wake up like this. It's a process. It's grace. I didn't just wake up like this. We didn't make it to 1,825 years. We didn't just wake up like this. We didn't wake up with money. We didn't wake up with members. It's only because of God's grace. I am everything that I am because of his grace. Grace gives you the grit to go beyond your gift. I just had to realize, Pastor B, that there's some stuff that God has not gifted me to do, but God does not call qualified people. God qualifies the people that he calls. It's his grace that gives you the grit to make it five years. Yeah, it takes, it takes guts to be a gatekeeper, but it takes grit to keep going. And I got grace. I love grace because you kind of see this in Moses' life. Because Moses also was somebody who understood what it means to live by God's grace. Check me out, Exodus chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. I'm going to throw a lot of scriptures at you for my note takers. Take them down. Listen to Moses. When God called Moses, this is what he said. Now go, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested, God, who am I? To appear before Pharaoh. Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered, watch this, I will be with you. I love that because Moses goes on to say, watch this, in, ver in chapter 10, in chapter 4, verse 10, Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been and I am not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Did you notice that Moses says, God, I can't talk, I can't preach, I ain't that good of a leader, and God never argued with him. He said, true that. 
But here's what you need to know. Y'all gonna miss this. Here comes your shout. I'll be with you. It don't matter whatever it is that I think I don't have, whatever it is that I haven't learned. God says, I know you're not all that, but here's the one thing that you need. My grace. I'll be with you every single step of the way. Moses says, I understand. I understand about grace. Because God's grace has given you the grit to make it this far. I love the story of Moses. Oh, that was just my intro. Now I'm getting ready to feed you. (laughs) Because Moses understood when God called him about this thing called grace. See, Moses, you remember the story. I I got people in here who know the Bible. You remember the story? God tells Moses on the backside of the desert, I need to go out. I want you to rescue my people. They've been crying out to me. And so God sends Moses in. You remember 10 plagues, last plague, death angel. Pharaoh says, I don't want no parts of your God. You guys get the heck out of Dodge. And then they left in the middle of the night. Did you ever realize that the reason why the Pharaoh and the Egyptians uh, were following the Israelites is because they left with all their stuff? Some of y'all just missed that. (laughs) They left with all their stuff. Pharaoh had already said, get out of here. But when he woke up in the morning, all they gold was gone. All their silver was gone. That's why they were chasing him because sometimes God will use the people who's been hating on you to bless you. My question is, I know you've been through some stuff, but what did you leave with? Okay, some of y'all missed that. Some of y'all missed that. I'm going to keep going. He says, Moses, I need you to go in and do what I'm asking you to do. Moses says, I can't talk well. I get tongue-tied. I'm, I'm not all that, God. God says, I know, but I'll be with you. Don't worry. Don't trip. I'll be with you. It's my grace. Y'all remember Moses. He took him out. And they got him out uh, in, the, in the desert, and he took him out there, and then they're wandering around, and then Moses said, okay, let's camp here. I'm going to go up on the mountain. I'm going to holler at God. I need to get the next instructions about what we're going to do. Uh, and then Moses came down. You remember this story? And the church went crazy. Can I just say something to y'all? Y'all crazy. <laughs> That's what, y'all don't realize that pastors deal with a lot of stuff. I'm not, I'm not trying to offend you, but come on now. Church folks are crazy. <laughs> Moses went up there and said, I'm trying to talk to God. He came down, and they got a party going on. Miriam up there serving Ciroc and drink. Okay, some of y'all are serving drinks. Aaron, his brother's on the ones and twos, and they got a party going on. And Moses says, y'all crazy. I'm done with these folks. <laughs> And he goes back up to talk to God again, and God says, God says, I'm done with these people. Because God knows we crazy. Church folks crazy. We try to act like we have it all together, but God says, I see y'all down there. You're partying. I just took you out of Egypt. You done left with all this stuff. I done blessed you with stuff that you don't even deserve. I done gave your wealth, and all the stuff you have came from your haters, and they got out there, and God told Moses, I'm done with these people. And Moses says, God, don't kill them. You ever... <laughs> You ever pray that prayer before where you're like, God, don't, don't, they create, come on, this is just pastors. Can I just talk to Pastor B? Well, we pray this prayer. Sometimes we talk about y'all and sometimes we change the names, but sometimes we don't. And, then, and Moses said, God, don't kill them. You ever pray that prayer where you say, God, don't, don't kill them. Just hurt them enough to know they're messing up. <laughs> he says, don't, don't kill them, God. Just hurt them enough to bring them to their senses. Some of y'all parents know what I'm talking about. God, don't kill my son. <laughs> Just hurt him real good. So he know that he's messing up. Don't kill him. And Moses says, don't kill him. He says, because how is it going to look that you brought your people out and then you didn't allow them to get to the promised land? Moses understood this issue called grace. He says, even when they're messing up, and I know I'm not that good, so I know they're not that good, but God, don't kill them. That's why I love the psalmist. Let me go back to Psalm 84. I'm taking you somewhere. For the Lord God, Psalm 84, 11, is a sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. Okay, I got to stop right there because, uh, you know, we love grace. Grace is what got us to five years. Grace is what got us to 1,825 days. Grace is what pushes you past your gift, even when you don't know what to do, when to do it, how to do it. All God says is, just do it and I'll be with you. Grace is what gets us to the place that we are today. But the psalmist says that God will give grace and glory. 
Okay, so now I'm going to get to the part where I'm getting uh, prophetic because my prayer for you is not to just keep riding on his grace. And then the psalmist goes on to say in verse 11, the Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Did I tell you my subject? My subject is grace, glory, and good things to come. And the psalmist says that you need grace, but you also need to experience God's glory. See, it takes guts to get started, and it takes grace to manage it, but it takes glory for God to move it forward. And the psalmist says that the Lord is our son and our shield, and he gives grace and glory. See, grace is for gatekeepers, but glory is for ground takers. Anybody want to take some ground over the next five years that I've had your grace, and it's helped me manage, and it helped me push past my gift? and the stuff I didn't know how to do and I didn't know when to do it and God says just get started just get started we're celebrating the day that this church started we're celebrating the fact that they didn't have all the money we didn't have all the gifts we didn't have all the members and God says I know you're not all that just do it and I'll be with you but now that I made it into the year of grace the psalmist says you need grace and you need his glory because grace is for gatekeepers. Grace is for people to get started. Grace is for people who know they don't have the gift. Grace is for people who know I don't have all the money. But the glory is for those who want to take some ground. Anybody want to take some ground? Because Moses understood this. He understood that grace helps you manage. But Moses knew that God's glory helps you move. And some of us, if I can just preach... Uh, because, you know, I'm just going to do what I do and then I'm going to head back to LaGrange. But some of us have found ourselves stuck. Financially stuck. In my marriage, stuck. In my faith walk, stuck. And Moses finds himself leading the people out of Egypt and they're in the wilderness. And I don't know if you know this about them, but they spent 40 years in the desert because they were stuck. Come on. Come on. And Moses prays something that the psalmist prays when he goes back to talk to God. I'm going to Exodus chapter 33. I'm building my case. Exodus chapter 33 verses 12 through 23. One day Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me take these people up to the promised land but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. Moses is saying this because when he went back up to talk to God, God said those folks down there are crazy. Y'all can keep it pushing but I'm not going with you. Moses says, God, we're not going another step unless we we know you're with us. Do I have anybody in here that says, you know what, God? There's some stuff I need to get done in my life. There's some stuff I need to be fixed. There's some promises that you gave me. There's some dreams that I have. And God, I'm not taking another step until you assure me that you're with me. Right. Moses said, I know they're crazy. Don't kill them. God said, okay, I'm not going to kill them, but y'all can keep it pushing. I'm done with these folks. And Moses says, but you haven't told me who you're going to send with me. We can't go by yourself. Moses goes on to say, you have told me. I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember, this is God talking to Moses. Don't you love how you can just talk to God and just tell him whatever it is on your mind? God, Moses says, and remember that this name is your very own people. Parents know what I'm talking about. That's your son. <laughs> you know how it is when somebody messes up, that's your daughter. Moses says, these are your people. Look, I was chilling on the backside of a desert, minding my own business. You over here burning up bushes, telling me to take my sandals off. You found me. These are your people, God. And how's it going to look if your people that you call don't make it to the promise? Don't put that on me. These are your people, God. Moses says, you need to do something about this because you're the one who's going to look bad if you don't continue your promise. And then the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses says, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. That's good enough right there that it'll preach itself. It's your presence that sets us apart. Part. I know you thought it was because you were fly, but the reason why people think you're all that is not because of you, it's because of his presence. Oh, 
Moses says that it's your presence. And the Lord replied, I will make it all my goodness pass before you. And you will call on my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose. And I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face. For no one may see me and live. And the Lord continued, look, stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock. And cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind but my face will not be seen. The other translations say Moses went up to the mountain that he knew that they couldn't move on without God and he says God I know we made it this far because of your grace but now God I need you watch this to show me your glory. Grace is great for starting but glory is great for keeping it moving and Moses says that God I know we made it this far but in order for us to move we're not going anywhere unless you know unless we know that you're with us show me your glory I love this because Moses now I'm getting into the the meat now I set all that up just to show you pastor y'all had five good years and you've been riding on grace but now my prayer for you is that God will show you his glory as Moses says that if we ever going to make it to what God promised you when he told you to start, we don't just need grace. We need him to show us his glory. God, we need your presence. I'm not taking another step. We're not going into five years in one day until we know God, you are with us. Moses says, show me your glory. Come on. Come on. Because I need to know that we're not going to. Continue to move. I love this because Moses, this is for my note takers, you got to understand that when it's time to move on, you got to say what you need. There's a story of a, three guys, they were uh, in the wilderness and they came up on this river and it was wide and it was deep and it was fast and it was rushing. They said, you know, we need to make it across this river. And so they prayed to God. The first guy prayed to God and said, God, give me the strength to cross this river. And boom, God gave him huge arms and legs, and he, he was strong, and so he swam. He almost drowned, but he swam upstream across this river, and it almost took him down, but he had the strength to do, and he finally made it over. And the second guy looked at the, the first guy and said, he, he prayed for strength. So the second guy said, God, God, give me strength and give me the tools that I need to make it across. And boom, God made him strong, but God also made him a boat, and he rode as hard and fast and furiously as he could, and he finally made it across, almost lost his life. And then the third guy looks at the first guy who prayed for strength. He looks at the second guy who prayed for strength, and the tools and then he says you know what here's what I need God I need you to make me strong I need you to give me the tools but I also need you to give me the wisdom and then boom God turned him into a woman he found the map crossed over the bridge and watched the other two guys look all my ladies say what what <laughs> say what you need he understood that I don't just need strength and tools. I need wisdom. Say what you need. Moses said, God, if we're going to make it to where you called us to go, we don't just need your grace. We need your glory. Yes, sir. Can I just say for some of you on the sound of my voice, there's some places that you need to go in life because you've been stuck in the same spot for far too long. And you keep praying for grace, but grace is good for management. Glory is good for movement. And if you want to move to the next level of your life, say what you need. God, I'm not taking another step until you reveal your glorious presence in my life. Moses says grace. Grace is good for managing, but now it's time to move. It's time to move. And so glad. I love this because here's where we get it messed up. And we think, watch this, that the glory is glamorous. Yeah, because we want to be fabulous, don't we? God, I want, I want your presence. But what you don't understand is that when you ask God for his glory, what you're really asking God for is to teach me how to grind. Ooh, yeah, because we live in a society now where everybody thinks that God's just going to drop it on your lap. And, and Moses prayed for God's glory. So here it is for my note takers. Watch what God does as he reveals his glory. Here's things that you're going to need to be able to do if you're going to move forward as a church and as individuals. Number one, stop.
stand on the rock. You missed it. Y'all missed it because God told Moses that the first thing you need to understand is, is that you can't see my face because it will kill you. And so he says, here's what I'm going to do. In order for you to experience my glorious presence, the first thing you need to do is I need to stand you on this rock. Okay, I thought I had some old school church people on here. On Christ. The solid rock I stand. That when the world is shifting, if you don't have something to stand on, you will never be able to experience God's presence. Here's my question for you. What are your core convictions? What is the thing that you're going to stand on no matter what? Because you can't experience God until you find yourself firmly footed on a foundation of Jesus Christ. He said, before I do anything for you, you need to learn how to stand. That's good because we live in a generation where everybody quits because it gets too hard. And the glory is not about you getting anything dropped in your lap. The glory is about you learning how to grind. That when any anything happens in your life that you didn't expect do you have the fortitude to keep standing we live in a generation where everybody wants it handed to them and God says I'll I'll let you experience my glory but what you need to understand is you got to find something to stand on and maybe some of the reason why I haven't moved forward in my life is because I won't take a stand there you go. Crickets. But isn't it interesting that some of the greatest movements that our nation has ever seen, and dare I say even the African American community has ever seen, seem to have be at a halt because we refuse to take a stand. God says, I can't give you what you need to move on until you learn how to take a stand. If you let go of everything, that means nothing ever really had you. He says, you need to learn. If you're going to move forward, you got to find a place to stand. Let me ask you this again. I want to. I want to mess with you for just a minute. I want to, as my church, as I say in my church, I want to bowl down your lane for just a second. What are your core convictions? Am I, have I not been able to realize the dreams that God has for me? Watch this. Not because dreams outrun, not because dreams uh, get away. Dreams simply just outrun us. Do I have the fortitude to keep chasing what God has called me to chase? Dreams don't die. They just outrun us. And if you don't have something that convicts you to your core, you will find yourself not being willing to stand on whatever God has promised. Every promise, we sung it ever, er, earlier, is yes and amen. And God is saying, that when you're saying, God, show me your will, and God is saying, show me yours. Will you stand for anything? Yeah, come on. And he says, uh, Moses, if you're going to make it, if y'all going to make it, you got to have some firm convictions. I got seven minutes. Can y'all give me ten? What are your core convictions? Stand on the rock. I love it in Hebrew because it wasn't just God saying, I'm going to give you something to stand on. He says that I'm going to put you in the crevice and I'm going to give you something to hide behind. So it literally says in Hebrew, I'm going to give you something to stand on and I'm going to give you something to stand behind. Okay, some of y'all missed that. Because when you're in pursuit of what God has called you to do, you best expect some fiery darts from the devil. But God says, in order for you to experience my glory, you need something to stand on and you need something to stand behind. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Pick up the shield of faith. Because the reason why the devil's not messing with you is because you ain't moving. When you start moving, you're going to need something to stand on and stand behind. So number one, stand on the rock. You want to experience God's glory because grace is for starting. Glory is for moving. So you need to have some core conviction. Stand on the rock. Number two, start taking risks. Yeah, come on. I say this all the time in our membership class. I think this is one of the things that we miss as Christians, that as Christians, and if you're not, we can hook you up today. We're glad you're here. If, you, if you're not a Christ follower, we can hook you up today. We're glad you're here. But for those of us who are Christians, watch this, we have forgotten that we are people who believe in things we can't see. 
That is in our DNA. We are called to make audacious and bold, risky moves for God. Take a step. Maybe some of the reason why I can't figure out how to move forward is because I'm too scared. Have you ever noticed that Paul tells Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he never says that God gives you courage? Did you notice that? He says that God gives you, watch this, the ingredients to be courageous. And sometimes that means that you have to find yourself in a situation that is fearful so that you have an opportunity to move forward. Okay, y'all miss me because I'm writing the text. God says, I'm going to stand you on the rock. Watch this. And he says, and then I have to remove my hand. Okay, some of y'all missed that because all of us want the blessing because we don't want the burden. God says, if you're going to experience my glory, then you're going to have to experience some stuff that in order for you to experience me, I have to temporarily, watch this, remove my hand. My question is, are you willing to do stuff that will put you out there? Then in order for me to move, I've got to be able to make some moves. I've got to understand that I've got to start taking risks. One of the things I love about uh, Five-year-olds, that's right around the time that they start learning how to ride a bike. Uh, sometimes, if you know, they can start doing it without training wheels. If you teach, I remember our youngest one, he's still trying to do his training wheels, but our, two older, our oldest one, I remember I was trying to teach him how to ride a bike uh, in the parking lot of an apartment that we lived in at the time, and I realized that, you know what, I can continue to keep my hand on this seat and let you just roll. But at some point, I got to remove my hand so you can ride. Some of y'all just missed that. Thank you, Tupac. Some of us need some ambitions as a rider. You've just been rolling through life and letting life happen to you. But God says, it's time to stop rolling and start riding. And in order for you to ride, I've got to temporarily remove my hand. Yeah, you might fall down. Yeah, you might scuff up your knees. Yeah, you might have to get back up and try it again. But in order for you to experience God's glory, you've got to be willing to put yourself out there. I love it because he told Moses I'm going to have to remove my hand if you really want what you say you want then I'm going to have to remove my hand see rolling is passive riding is aggressive and risky we're people who are called to make bold moves for God. If you want to tear this city upside down, I tell my staff and, my, and the elders and everyone in our church, you have got to learn how to put yourself out there. God, I don't have the gifts. God, we don't have the money. God, we don't know how we're going to get this done, but we're just expecting for your glory to show up because there's some stuff that I'm never going to be able to do by myself, but there's some stuff I will never experience until I put myself out there. And he says, if you want this, I got to remove my hand. I love Malcolm Gladwell in his book, David and Goliath. He says this about courage. Courage is not something you already have that makes you brave when tough times start. Courage is what you earn when you've been through tough times and you discover they ain't so tough after all. That's why you can celebrate five years because there's been some tough days over the last five years. But you know how I know you have the courage to keep it pushing because you made it one thing. 1,825 days and it has developed in you the courage to say that no matter what, come hell or high water, God, we're going to get out there and turn this county upside down. God says, if you want that, I'm going to have to let you go through something. So I love about this because, watch this, God gets no glory, watch me, when you have no guts. When we play it safe, Come on. who's going to ask you about the God you serve because you've been sitting on your blessed assurance doing nothing for the last 40 years because you're too scared to trust God? God gets no glory when you have no guts. Let me just write off a couple of questions. What is the next great risk that God may be waiting for you to take? What, what is the great risk that God may be waiting for you to take? Where might God's hand be removed, not to harm you, but to help you? Come on now, because as long as he keeps his hand on you, most of us ain't going to do nothing. Because we've lots, watch this, we've allowed our blessings to become our brace. 
Moses literally asked God for something that might end him. What is it that you're asking God for that might be the end of you? No, not, not literally, but figuratively, because maybe that's what Jesus is talking about when he says that I am, he says that, he says um, that I came to give you abundant life. If you read just before that, they were asking a whole lot of questions to the blind man, and the blind man said, I don't know who he is. And Jesus, in a subtle way, kind of says that when you venture out to the edge of yourself, you find this doorway into an extraordinary life. The problem that most of us have is that we haven't asked God for something that will end me. I need God to do something that will give me the John the Baptist prayer that I will decrease so that God will increase. And there's some stuff that I need to be praying for that will be the absolute death of me because in order for me to go where God is calling me, he don't need you, he needs him in you. Come on. Moses literally asked for something that might be the end of us. Most of us, our blessings have become our brace. I prop myself up on what God did over the first five years because his grace is sufficient. But Moses and the psalmist says that God will give grace and glory. Here's the last thing and then I'm going to wrap. Is this good? Are y'all getting anything? So, so. I need you to I need you to say what you need. I need you to stand on the rock. I need you to start taking risks. And the last one is celebrate your future. I know it don't start with S, but it's phonetically right. Celebrate your future. <laughs> because when God says, watch this, this is my favorite part of this text. When God says that I'll stand you on the rock and I'll stand you behind something, he says, I'm gonna remove my hand and I need to make sure that you can still stand when my hand is removed. He says, then I'm gonna pass by you and you'll see my back. See, here's what most of us miss it because we thought that he meant back as in anatomy. But in Hebrew, the word back literally means, watch this, the residue that have already gone before you. Okay, some of y'all missed that. I thought I had a church in here. Some of y'all need to understand that when God says you can experience my glory, what you experience is knowing that I've already arrived at the place that I'm calling you to go. And the reason why you can celebrate your future is because God has already made the crooked way straight. When he told Moses that you'll see my back, what he was telling Moses is you will see a glimpse of where I'm taking you because I've already been there and I'm reporting from where I'm calling you to you. That's why the vision says make the vision plain. And it says the vision calls from the end. Some of us read it wrong. What we say, he says the vision speaks of the end. It literally says that the vision calls you from the end. And the thing that propels you to chase it is because there's something that's calling me to move even when I'm too afraid. There's something that's calling me to move even when I don't have the answers. God's glory is God's glimpse of what he's already done. He celebrates that. Watch Haggai. Here's the part where I'm going to pray for you now. Haggai 2, 7 through 9. This is my prayer for Mosaic Church. He says, I will shake all the nations and the treasures of all the nations we brought to this temple. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's army. God gives grace and glory. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's army. You know all the stuff you didn't have when you started? God says, I got it. He says, I have everything that you need. And then he says, the future glory. Okay, y'all missed it, man. That's a good place to shout of this temple will be greater than the past glory says the Lord of heaven's armies and I will bring and in this place I will bring peace some of y'all miss it and the future glory in other words you thought you've seen something but in other words he's saying what I'm getting ready to do okay y'all just missed it the future glory will be greater than what you've ever experienced that whatever God has done over the last 1,825 days you ain't seen nothing yet. The future glory will be greater than the past glory because God says I will give grace and glory. Let me read it. Let me put all the psalms together. A single day 
in your court. Psalm 84, 10, 11. I'm putting the whole thing together and I'm done. It's better than a thousand elsewhere. You had the grace to get started. You had the grace to be a gatekeeper. You had the grace to stand on day one and say, come hell or high water, I would rather spend one day following my calling than doing something else. But he says that I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than to live the good life in the homes of the wicked. Then he puts it together. For the Lord God is our son and our shield and he gives grace. Okay, I thought I was going to get a response. And glory. He gives grace to manage, but he gives glory to move. He gives grace to help you get started, but he gives glory to help it become a movement. He gives grace because you don't have the gift, but he gives glory so you can make this thing work. He gives grace because you don't know what to do, but he gives glory because he knows where he's taking you. He gives grace because you don't have it all together, but he gives you glory because he's taking you to a promise. He gives you grace because you don't have anything to do. You don't know how to do it, when to do it, or why to do it, but the Lord God gives grace and glory. Here's my last part. And the Lord will withhold. Watch this. Did I tell you on my subject? Grace, glory, and the Lord will withhold. Watch me. No good thing from those who do what's right. Don't be weary in your well doing because in due season, in due season. I know you feel like fainting, but in due season, the Lord will not withhold any good thing that he has in store for you. Show me your glory. I just want to pray for you. Because what God is intending to take this church this is the prophetic part. The future glory is greater than the former glory. See, he's giving you the grace to grind. He's giving you the grace beyond your gift. We talk about it all the time. We both know where we're weak at. There's plenty of stuff that we don't know how to do passes. We don't have it all together, but God gives us the grace to keep grinding and grace to have some grit. But now, in year five, where you've experienced his grace, my prayer is that he lets you experience his glory. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much. For your word, we thank you, God, that you give us the grace to keep hustling, and the grace to keep moving, and the grace to keep grinding, and the grace to stay gritty, and the grace to keep learning what we need to learn, and the grace to keep it going, even when people doubt us, and when the enemy comes against us, and when we don't have the members, and we don't have the money, we don't have the budget, God, you've given us grace. The only reason why we've lasted 1,825 days is because of your grace. We can't preach that good. We don't sing that good. But the doors are still open because of your grace. Yes. But now, God, we're ready to move. We thank you for your grace because it helps us manage. But, God, we need, as Moses prayed, to experience your glory so that we can move beyond just managing and into mission and vision. God, we thank you and we love you. Help us experience something incredible, even if it means temporarily you have to remove your hand so that we can see the evidence that you've already gone before us. God, we love you and we thank you and we bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give God some praise.